Good evening, and um, I'd really like to acknowledge and honour the Elders past and present of this beautiful country, Durrumbul country that we meet on. And I'd also like to thank the organisers of TEDx because this is just wonderful and amazing, so thank you for all your work. And I'd like to talk about guess who's coming to dinner, and it's really wonderful that I'm actually talking at this time because it's just before we all go and have dinner. And it's about who's sitting at the table and what we're doing. But first, if I get this right, oh, let's have a look and see what we have on the menu. So we have, for entree, a nice healthy dollop of theory, because that always makes it settle nicely, right? And we go on to a main with a cross-cultural couscous. We have some al dente attachment, some lovely clarified connectedness, which I think will be very nice. And we'll finish with the dessert of some poached practicalities. So let's start with our entree. So to start with the theory of what we are going to talk about, we need to be looking at sociology and psychology. Sociology, of course, is the study of society, and there's lots of old opinions around ever since the Enlightenment right through to Karl Marx, Weber, and a few more interesting modern thinkers. Psychology, of course, is the study of the mind. And again, there's lots of old opinions ever since the Enlightenment and Freud and Jung and Horney and a few other interesting people of which we will be talking about. The interesting thing here is that so many times sociology and psychology are kept apart. And I don't think we can do that so much anymore. I think there are many subjects where we need to bring them side by side, particularly when we're talking maybe depression, suicide, families, the future because our society is changing so quickly and is having quite a psychological effect on ourselves in particular. Durkheim was a very interesting man and he brought these things together when he talked about suicide. He talked about that, yes, it was one person's actions, but it was actually quite different from an individual thing because it was more about the society in which one person would be. And he talked about integration and regulation and anime, fatalism. And these things are looked at like hopelessness, worthlessness, helplessness, not feeling like there's anything for you in your own future, which is a very sad place to be. Depression also brings up the idea of hopelessness, worthlessness, helplessness, a total disconnection of anything around you. And we all know when there's an increase of depression, there's a higher likelihood of suicide. So let's now go on to our main fair, shall we? Now we're going to talk about a little cross-cultural study, which is um, from psychology by a man named Barry, who talks about when two cultures come together and the four processes that could happen, which would be integration, assimilation, separation and marginalisation. We shall go into these just a little bit more because this is the important stuff and it's got the Sven Viograms to ex explain what I'm talking about. Interest in both maintaining one's original culture, that might be yourself when you meet somebody else, and retaining daily interactions with others. So I think that I'm okay and he's okay too. He might have some strange ideas. I don't have to take them all on. I might take one or two on if they're worth it. And he might think, yeah, well, she's pretty cool. She's got some strange ideas. I might take one or two on, but I don't have to take them all on. In which case, there is the original, there is the other, and there's this little bit down the centre that you can see. And that is where we are integrating. And that is like what we'd like to happen here in Australia with all the new people coming into the shores where they can still feel important and valued as well as integrate with the main population because then everybody's feeling worthwhile. Here you had my lovely son-in-law and his grandfather integrating over a bloody big dessert. We have assimilation. Now this is a really sad thing, I think, because this stinks of the white Australia policy, where there was maybe someone's original culture and it was just had to be totally taken over by the dominant culture. I'm of Lebanese background and we were never allowed to speak language. I grew up in the 60s. I know no one would think I'm 50, but I am. So I grew up in white Australia. 
and the white Australian policy time. It was a very interesting place to be and I could never work out why they kept calling England the old country. I mean, what the hell that's about, I don't know, because it wasn't my old country, that's for sure. But this is a simulation and, and it's when there's little possibility or interest in the culture of where you come from and you just have to give it all up to be the dominant culture. There's also the separation stuff and you might see this in places maybe in Melbourne where they have a little, used to have little Greece and a little Vietnam and a little something else. Okay, so there's like two entirely different things and they are never going to come together. When we go back and look at enemy and Durkheim's idea where there's a reduction of self-worth, then we will have alienation, purposelessness, worthlessness and hopelessness which is very much in line with what happens when people are separated or marginalised. So these people are exposed to a new dominant culture but they don't want to be part of that and they don't really want to be part of their own culture either so they end up living on the fringe or as a, on the margins so they kind of feel fairly helpless, totally unsupported, of no value, totally worthless and totally hopeless of any change in the future, which we've already seen are big markers for depression and suicide. Here is my beautiful daughter and my very beautiful granddaughter doing a little cross-cultural study, having a little bit of integration into the Japanese culture of sushi. Now, Bowlby was a very interesting man and he actually has a lot to say about attachment and bonding. And he, of course, is a psychologist and he talks about the universal human need to form close bonds with people. The need to create a secure base with somebody. And this is then what becomes a model for our future relationships. And through this bonding, we can feel worth, support. We can feel we can get help, we can help others. There's hope for our own future. And as such, this is a very, very strong, important survival thing that we need to be encouraging. So, in a family, when we're integrating, then we would have a little diagram look, that looks like this. We are all our own individual people, but we all integrate and we share a little bit of ourselves with each other. Oh. And you can see they're all very individual, those people. My son looking like a French maid and my daughter being a pregnant Fran Vine and my son-in-law being a female because it was an F party and me being a flower girl because I was being sweet that day. It doesn't happen often. Okay, but we can see where we can all be individuals but we can also share ourselves with others and this would be what a secure attachment looks like. It provi provides psychological protection. It maintains the child's metabolism, so they don't have to get all upset and feeling insecure. We then can um, develop close ties and provide prototypes for our latest social relationships, which is exactly what Mr. Bowlby was talking about. It's a very, very important part of life we have to do and redo, because then we have children and we need to be able to bond with them, and so life goes on. Now, the interesting stuff is that when those bonds have been severed, which in the Bringing Them Home report, was, which was the report that was done in 1997 um, around the stolen generation of our Indigenous families, then we found that the effect of marginalisation and the destruction of culture and country had a devastating, absolutely devastating effect not only on the people whose children were taken away, but the children that were taken away. And now to this day, with my work at Aboriginal and the Health Service, I can tell you that the parenting of the ones that were taken away has just been decimated. They have nothing. They have nothing because they were never allowed to go through the bonding. They have to be uh, taught, unfortunately, about so many things because they were, it was taken away way too young and it's really sad to see those things still happening now and they live with a hopelessness, a worthlessness and a helplessness 
which is a depression. Okay, so the connectedness stuff is so important. It gives meaning to life. It enables a person to participate in community. It gives them worth. They feel worthy, they feel of value, they feel helpful, they can help other people, they feel hopeful for their own future, and the whole world is a good place. Here's a grandma, <laughs> granddaughter, doing a little connecting. It's those sorts of moments that we have to create in our life to find the time to connect and to have just time to be there. Even if it's that, you know, little baby Pearl wants to fall asleep on my lap, then that's okay. That's her connecting. That's wonderful. I have a very busy life, as most of us do. I actually book in play dates with my granddaughter, so I have time for this. Because if I didn't, there'd be weeks would go by and I wouldn't see her, and that's too sad. And so that was one of our play dates where we both got exhausted. And that is what creates intimacy. Having that time to spend. But we're all very, very busy people. Okay? But with relationships are solid at a community level and individuals feel strong, then we can build stronger communities and stronger individuals and that's what we need to have to be looking to the future. Instead of being more and more segregated, instead of being more and more separated. And now we shall go on to the dessert. Because I think that I've done the case of why we need to be attached, why we need to be connected, why we need to do these bonds. But of course the big question is, how are we going to do them? How are we going to draw people closer? How are we going to let the people around us know that we want to be connected and it's important to be connected? You know, we need to let our children know they can always come home. My dad, bless him, always said, no matter what you do, Loretta, you can always come home. And that was, gave me so much strength to go out and explore and play with things I should never have touched because I'm that kind of person. But that's okay, he didn't know it was on the other side of the country. But I always knew whatever happened, I could come home. And it just upsets me immensely when some of my clients say, well, no, I'm in this DV relationship, but mum and dad said if I was going to be with him, they don't want to know any more about me, and they've just, that's it, it's over, it's done. One of the things I love working with Indigenous people, and they've taught me so much, is about how tight they pull their own family. One of the most amazing things I saw as I was in Townsville working with a woman who had been raped. And the man that had raped her had actually uh, been around the neighbourhood quite a few times and had a long string of offences. You know, every day his father was there supporting him with his oxygen cylinder and two of his sisters were there supporting that man. And for whatever you think about the man, I just thought they were an amazing family because I don't know if I could have given that kind of support to that person. But they did. And I just thought, that is incredible. So that's the important stuff. So every day, every day we need to find a way. And with tight schedules and everything else, I think it's time to take time to dine. Social media ain't always social, especially when it's at the table, and especially when there's people sitting around. This is a very old picture here of people with the TV dinners and what a great thing they were. But how can you talk, how can you communicate, how can you build bonds if the television's going? How many times do we see people when we're out and about and everybody around the table's got a phone and they're all going, D -d -d no one's talking here. Yeah? Happens all the time. All the time. And I get really worried now because sometimes I do a lot of home visiting and sometimes I go into homes that don't even have dining tables. Now, that really frightens me because I think, where is their meeting place? Where do they actually go to come together and chat and talk about what happened that day? You know, where do they get the place to build those bonds? We're all very busy people. Someone was telling me that they had a, um, a family and one guy had actually fallen asleep and had a rotten tooth and had blood poisoning and was nearly dead and they just thought he was in there watching movies because they hadn't seen him for days and that was not unusual. So it's a bit of a worry. So I think it's time, it's 
definitely time that we go back to some of those old ideas where the television goes off, everything goes off, we sit down at the table as a family or as a group of people that are there in the house and talk to each other. So many times when I'm doing relationship work or anything else, the first thing I say is, so where do you guys have dinner? And so many times they go, oh, well, you know, sometimes they make dinner for the kids and then husband and I might sit and watch the news. And, and one person even had one of those swing around things. So as they went from the, from the lounge room into the dining room, they could swing the TV around so they didn't miss a second of TV. It was amazing. I grew up, my mother's a Doctor Who person, as I have grown to be as well. And so we always knew that dinner was always going to be ready at the end of Doctor Who, not one second before. <laughs> not one second after, it was always going to be at the end of Doctor Who. So, it's just as well the ABC was really good with time and wasn't Queensland Rail, which are never good at time, because that's what we knew. And it was a drain, it was horrible, and it must have been a pain for my mother, because I'm one of seven children, but it became our pattern, and it is wonderful, and we still do that. And I think it's really important, and most of us probably do come from there, but I don't know if we're recreating that back in our own homes in the way we should. So I think the whole idea of social media needs its place. I think we need to limit the amount of screens our children are watching, how much time we're doing there, what they're doing. My son, the other day, I was um, got up and I was just checking the news. I thought, oh, I'll just check Facebook, make sure my son's still alive, you know how it goes. And he had put in a picture of that poor man over in England that was hacked. There was a picture of one of the soldiers, the men that did the hacking. I thought, I don't want to see this at breakfast time. It's not really very social, that social media. I think it's time that we started really thinking about what we're allowing to come into our homes. There was another big article today about how um, the American president used social media to win the last election. And I'm thinking, what are we letting into our house? I don't want to wake up and see Tony Abbott talking to me on Facebook. <laughs> I think I may be sick. It's give me indigestion, and that's no good. But I would like you all to think about this and take this forward. And next time you go and sit in front of the TV, turn the bloody thing off and get up and go to the table. Clear it off. Get all the books off, get all the paperwork, get the laptops off, close them down, tell the children, no phones at the table. And that includes you guys, that includes mum and dad and everybody, you're not to answer them. The whole world will not stop if you don't answer the phone for 10 minutes. Thank you for your time.